Maybe I'm Casey, maybe I'm Casey, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not. All right, fiance is in the house. Hey, hey squad, squad. Name is Earl. Earl? Yeah. Earl Watson. <laughs> the homie hey. Earl. Thanks, yes. yes. Same through. Um, thank you for joining us yes. again. Um, and actually, this is the first time that you've seen Brandon since since the wedding. Yeah, congrats. Yeah, man. no, yeah. appreciate see, you. Appreciate I see you, you with the ring on. Not, come on, I mean. The, the, the no Limit <laughs> Master P. You know what I'm saying? Crazy, you know what I'm saying? You know what $6 saying? Amazon, you know, fit me, whatever. Camo you know mode is dope. <laughs> <laughs> Don't throw jokes. No, that's compliment. No, no I, I grew up, I know, I grew I up know, listening I to Masterpiece. One no, of my closest friends, mentor. You know, no, yes. no limit regular no, first I, to actually do it. You know, entrepreneur. Why are you coming at me like that? I got really the hookup part two is coming out. The hookup part two is not coming out. Yes, 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 it's coming out. You you involved? I wish I was. He didn't call me for that one. Oh though. man. But he called me to train his Master son. Masterpiece a hooper though. He called me to trade and say. He called me. Oh. He didn't call me for the investment. Like you, know. you got, you got, you got young P. Miller to yeah, young Hersey. He's good. Young per- Percy yeah, to the USC. Game. Yeah, uh, no, I don't know about that, but he's good. <laughs> <laughs> he played for USC. No, nah, that's that's the older son. It's the younger son in high school. Oh. He has See, I don't even son, mind Percy Miller. You know, I mean? you know what I mean? Let me back off. You know what I'm saying? But shouts out to y'all. You know what I mean? Appreciate y'all coming through for the wedding. You know what I mean? Y'all, the wedding was great. Y'all was hanging out with my cousin TT, who's who yes. trying to get on No Limit yeah, 2. Yeah, shout probably. out to TT. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. The real one. TT yeah. is Team Joy. <laughs> She's the realest one in the family. Why y'all, uh, the, 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 what is this? Like... She was, I put her next to y'all because I feel like y'all y'all need to be comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You need some, some real, you know what I'm saying? No, little it was ratchet. a good time, though. Yeah. I, yeah. I, mean, I, I cried. I'm not going to lie. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, Michelle's I didn't vows were very good. She she killed me on the vows, you know what I'm saying? I kind of wrote my vows kind of last second. I wanted to, I wanted the photog to get them, you know what I'm saying? They got me writing, you know what I'm saying? Sweating <laughs> out there. You know, you know, I'm a content guy. I be thinking. When, do all the, when does all the content come out? You know what? I'm not going to put people on blast right now, but I've been refreshing my emails, and I'm like, uh, does this usually take time like this? It does like, it, 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 take a little time. They want to okay. get it right, you know? Okay. Get all the filters right. Well, we're still waiting. Anyway, um, thanks for joining us, yeah. Earl. Thanks for having me. Um, so the the March Madness is in full effect yeah. right now, and everyone's talking about Zion and Ja and R.J. Barrett mm-hmm. and obviously Taco Fall, and that game was great. We, had, we were watching it. And... Uh, recently, Paul Pierce said that Zion is a top 50 basketball player in the world right now. Currently. Yeah, right now. What, what do you think about that? I think that's tough to give it to him right now. I think what he's seeing is the progression and potential of his game. He's so unique. He is not um, an analytic type of guy where analytics are all about skill from beyond the three. But he is kind of because everything he does is at the rim. So that's that's a powerful analytic. Where he's going to have to improve on is making free throws. Because at the next level, he should get to the free throw line six to ten times per game. He's going to eventually have to, have to develop a three-point shot. The mid-range is never going to be there because he's so athletic. You want to just get to the rim and just finish and get to the free throw line. So how analytics work in the NBA is the layup and dunk is the best shot. Points per possession. And then after that, you usually get fouled, so free throw is second, and then corner three is third. Anything outside on the arc, you really don't want to take that shot unless you James Harden, Devin Booker, or Kyrie Irving. And even then, that point per possession is kind of similar to anything below one is, is not good. So is it is it kind of disrespectful to guys who are in the league who have – Develop their skill to a higher level to say that Zion is better than them right now is that a, not maybe not disrespectful is it a bit reactionary in the moment? I think Paul is a servant. He sees it, and guys in the league mm. used to take that as disrespect. But now with social media and with the you know the fanfare of creating images, I think it's good for the sport of basketball because we talk about it a lot. Is who's the next face of the NBA? Like we can we can hate on LeBron all we want. We hate it on Kobe, but when Kobe left, we was like, "Damn, what's next?" Right. And then LeBron came whoa, like, whoa, whoa. "Who said that?" When, when Kobe left, man, when Kobe left, the whole league was kind of like hurt. He had the greatest basketball commercial for a retirement. People that booed him cheered him. You didn't like Kobe? No, 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 no. But but it, LeBron was still there. I don't think we're at a loss as much as we are looking at the landscape and saying who is next when LeBron hangs it up. Let me say this. Without the Celtics 
and the Lakers being relevant, the NBA is painfully hurt. Mm. You look at it now, the Lakers haven't been the same since Kobe really retired, even though we have LeBron. Bron has to get to the playoffs. Kyrie has to have an amazing playoff run for the Celtics to be great. Mm -hmm. The NBA need those two franchises to be successful, especially if not the Knicks, if that makes sense. So John Morant had an incredible first round, and then obviously, you know, they have its team game, so he did what he could. Yes. How do you think he translates to the NBA? A uh, high basketball skill. His three-point shooting has improved from the first year to the second year. Points per game, I think, plus 15. Um, he has a two-to-one assist ratio. I think it's like 10 assists, five turnovers. That's going to go down. Point guards need more experience. The toughest positions to play in the league at any level is the point guard position and the center position because – point guard position in the NBA, you have so many sets, so many options, so many great, you know, opposing players on the other team you have to defend, and you have to keep everyone together. You become a therapist in the huddles mm-hmm. and in the timeouts and in the locker room, and then you also have to find your game. Center position is a man's game, the strength and the size. You can't teach the grown man strength, and you can't teach weight room for 15 years. You have to, like, develop into that. So he's going to be great. His IQ is high. He's a savant. He's beyond his years. He can pass with both hands, and he finishes well above the rim. What's a team that would that could use him? Because he's, he's supposed to go high. Any team could use him, but I think this draft is more of a needs draft. And what I mean by that, if the Knicks get him, do they really need him? They don't need him. No. So they're going to take the number one pick. The number one pick, if they get, is obviously Zion. Mm-hmm. But if you're absolutely going to get KD and you're going to get Kyrie and you think you have a great chance, I'm trading that number one pick for Devin Booker. I'm just being honest Ooh. because you want to come in. He's a young superstar. Walking you want to bucket. Walk in bucket. He just had 59 last night, and his confidence is supremely Easy. high, and he's beyond his years as far as maturity on and off the court. So I would trade that pick for him, and if I couldn't get him, I'd keep Zion and develop. And you got to say, is, is, the, is the Zion pick worth a Devin Booker? Devin Booker can handle New York City. He can handle the, the, you know, the, the pressures. He played at Kentucky. He loves, to, he loves the responsibility of ending games. And you can't tell me with a lineup potentially of uh, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and Devin Booker mm. in New York. That's not championship quality right there. For years to come. Okay, I understand. I, I think it really is cute talking about both those guys going to the Knicks. But I think it's cute because there's no way that Kyrie is going anywhere but with his old homeboy LeBron. I think I think get the squad back together. Kyrie joins the Lakers. Get whatever other extra piece you need. And that's a championship team if they're healthy. The way Kyrie and LeBron broke up, it was like a bad breakup. And sometimes you have a bad breakup and you just got to go back to that past and like, hey, look. It was bad. I respect you. Thank you for everything you told me, but we can never be together again. And I think that's kind of like what you had with the Kyrie reaching back out to LeBron saying, I see what it is. And people are reading too much into that. People are reading too much into that because Kyrie does respect that that time and that moment with LeBron. But one thing I know about Kyrie, he's very much confident in himself. I don't think he can ever go back and replace that. Like Kyrie to the Lakers doesn't make sense. Kyrie to New York, he's a he's an East Coast guy. He's played at Duke. That makes all the sense in the world. And if KD really isn't staying in Golden State, why wouldn't you put the two best skilled players in the NBA on the same team? Because Kevin Durant's still trying to be number one. He still wants to be seen as number one. You get him on a team with another guy who makes these shots. I think Kevin Durant is tired of being number two on his own team and in the NBA period. But I, I, I mean, I, I don't think that. Kyrie would be number one over KD if he was, he was in New York? I think I think Kyrie understands that he's a great 1A. Mm-hmm. Kevin understands that I can share with anyone. I'm already sharing with three or four guys now, but if I can just share with one more player and we go to New York and do something great, why not? So KD is a one in New York, but KD, KD's ego isn't like that. Mm. KD was my teammate the first two years of his career, he really is like a people person. Like this superstar status that people want him to live with and want him to act a certain way. KD's going to be KD. KD, he socializes with people. His rookie year, he's playing video games with local kids in the neighborhood before our game. Like, oh, yeah, I was playing video games with kids in the neighborhood and I came to the game. I'm like, what? Who does that? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just KD. But yeah. he, he is one of the best um, down-to-earth superstars that we have and he's never going to ever be over cocky or have this ego 
that exceeds off the court. Now, on the court, he's a beast. He's a monster. Mm -hmm. He's not going to talk a lot. You give him the ball, just get the hell out the way. But off the court, he's easy going. And sometimes he gets knocked for that. But it just he is who he is. You got to love it. Yeah, I think that KD's already shown that he can play with other people. And Kyrie, all the issues that they're having, that the Celtics are having, clearly shows that he's okay with being with somebody else that he that he can play with. Do you think the problems that the Celtics are having right now are because Kyrie, because of the system, or because of Kyrie's like leadership? Sometimes in the NBA, you can have too much, and if you have mm. too much, before players get, players always search for identity through style of play and through contract extensions. Your contract extension is going to give you identity. Meaning if I get paid X amount of millions, I already know what my role is. Can't tell me nothing less. Right. You paid me for this role. Right. You got a lot of players coming off the bench, or a lot of players who are with the Celtics who are young, who have yet to get their big money deal. And when you have that in the locker room, and this is what I'm hearing constantly without people saying it, like players saying it, you know, you have Kyrie talk about, you know, so many players want the ball at the end of the game, or whose team is mm -hmm. it? When you coach a superstar in the league, it's different from coaching a star. A star to me in the league is a young Tatum, is a, is a young Brown. A superstar is Kyrie Irving. Then they're done that solidified. That's a different conversation that the head coach, the GM, and all the coaching staff need to have. That's a conversation they need to get off the court to let him know and to you know go through him and go to dinners and connect beyond because right. superstars are, are very moody. Now, they're moody for a reason because they're that great and their mind has so much on it and mm -hmm. they see things a little bit deeper. Their mind connect and they can change and form and transform different things quickly in the game. So to me, going into the playoffs or as soon as possible, I'm hearing Kyrie saying he wants the head coach. And I'm not saying he didn't do it because I don't know. He wants Brad Stevens to put everyone in a room and tell them what their role is, even down to X amount of shots per Isn't game. Isn't it too late for that? It, it, it's never too late to make a change and to grow. Like, growth is never too late. Like, you want to start the season like that, and you were hoping a style of playing, you have enough good people where it will happen. But right mm -hmm. now, something has to change because you're going into the playoffs with a fractured team. If you don't fix the fracture and put a cast on it, it's going to break. And that's what you're getting right now with the Celtics. Super talented, amazing coaching staff, one of the best closers the game has ever seen. Mm -hmm. But no one knows their role. Because Tatum is really that good. He's that good to carry a franchise. But you have to pick. You have to pick who's going to get the shot at the end of the game. Like, that's the hardest thing to do in a huddle when it's a minute 20 on the clock because you have this timeout clock that goes. Mm -hmm. It's a minute 20. It counts down until your timeout is over. And you got to look in the eyes of two players who really want that last shot. Right. And you got to say, uh, it's it's you. But when you really should already know who would, who's going to take the last it, shot. It has to be Kyrie. Right. Kyrie all the time. Second option is always Tatum, but only if Kyrie can't get a shot. So if the Celtics can't get it together, who do you like in the East? I... I personally like the Raptors. I know I feel got like to. it's kind of a... You too? I said you got to. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the feeling on the Raptors is a little bit of a hangover of the last couple of years where, you know, LeBron was in the East, so they'd have an incredible regular season, and then they get to the playoffs, and, you know, we all know what happens. But I don't, I don't feel like sweet, it's the same sweet. team this year. Uh, the Raptors are going to be good because you can't teach is You can't teach championship experience. You either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. They have it with Kawhi and all the pieces they brought from Danny San Antonio. Green. Danny Green. And just they have a great deep. And Pascal's playing. He should be, like, most improved. He's playing amazing. Shout-outs to Rico Hines, my Shout teammate out. from UCLA. Who's, I think who's I, doing it big oh, right now. He, he, he's like this Dr. <laughs> Frankenstein of, of hoops, right? And then you have, to me, the Sixers who made big moves – yeah. in the trade deadline and it's a move that no one talks about and I had this kid in the G League with the Spurs then the Spurs signed him and he had an amazing playoff run and got paid and now he found his way with the Sixers is Jonathan Simmons he's 6'6 oh, yeah. an amazing mm -hmm. defender an amazing playmaker and he is confident he doesn't care where he's from he doesn't care what the status is he is going at your heart right. it's like it's a heart check when he gets in the court and he's going to be monumental in defense Ending players, even point guards, one through three. So the Sixers have a chance to disrupt a lot of things. You got Milwaukee. And everyone everyone kind of just forgets about Milwaukee. You, you have Milwaukee. They you have limping, to they limping towards it because they, they have some injuries. And do you trust that team with one even one person out, one of those starters out? Well, the thing about the playoffs is different because in the playoffs, teams can really lock in and take away 
first and second options. Yep. Okay. I think when you're heading into the playoffs, this is significant. Your role players have to be playing at a high level. Your, your superstars are taking a mental break because they've been pushing all season. Mm-hmm. So mentally, what you're seeing a lot is a lot of superstars struggling because they're just mentally exhausted. And they're going to find a way to get refreshed for the playoffs. They're just dialing it down. And this is a time where you see the Spurs role players go off. Right. And he does it for a reason. Pop positions that for a reason. So these these role players for OKC, these role players for Toronto, these role players for all these teams, Boston making a playoff push. You gotta take you gotta take your game up. If you can't take your game up, then you need to be there for your superstar. And if not, you're gonna go into the playoffs and you can't turn it on. A role player cannot turn it on. Superstars mm. can. Speaking of the Spurs, are they gonna ruin someone's uh, playoff run? I mean, you can never count Pop out. To me, Pop is, you know, he's legendary. Well, we, do, we do every year. He's, yeah. he's constantly reinventing himself. He's constantly ahead of the game. He has his players playing at the highest level. And they're rolling right now. They're rolling yeah. right now. So anytime you play the Spurs, you got to say, we're going into this with a six to seven game series potentially. And if we sweep them, then we potentially might win the whole thing. You know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's that, it's that, it's that obvious to me. And the Spurs. The Spurs are dangerous right now, especially DeMar DeRozan. And LaMarcus Aldridge is playing out of his mind, as he usually does around this time every year. But what you're not seeing with the Celtics, or what you're seeing with the Philadelphia, the Sixers, and not the Celtics, are those role players are playing their role to the T. You see Jimmy Butler in the last two minutes of the fourth, taking he's taking all the shots. And everybody, everybody who's getting rebounds throwing back out to him. That's why I think the Sixers are more dangerous than anyone in the East right now because they're figuring it out right now going into the playoffs. I think I think exactly what you're saying is the Sixers, they all know their role. There's yeah. not, you know, you just said Jimmy Butler down a the stretch. There's not no fight over the ball with Ben Simmons or Embiid. They kind of know when it's time to go who to give the ball to. And Jimmy has that dominant personality, too, where you really don't have to say it because he's going to tell you in the locker room, mm-hmm. hey, yo, end of the game, that's, that's my shot. I appreciate all the work you're doing throughout the game. <laughs> like, set this set this pick and roll, right. let me make right. the play, and yeah. basically get the f*** out of my way. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, it just is what it is. And you have players who have that personality. Mm-hmm. Then you have players like Kyrie who's highly enlightened. And, you know, he can say it that simple, but he's like, it's not my job to say it. It's the coach's job to say well, it. Well, Westbrook has that personality, and he's doing his best. I mean, he's, he's struggling really bad right now. Just don't uh, say it like that. I, Russ has that personality, but Russ is also matured at the point where he say, hey, Paul George, go. Like, it's, it's you're the best player in the world right now. I'm just happy to be beside you. But don't get it twisted. Like, if I get the shot, I'm shooting it. Like, it's just, it's just Russ. And I think Russ is struggling because he had an injury. Mm-hmm. He's worked his ass off all summer. And he plays so aggressively. And you're kind of seeing the same transformation with LeBron or any athletic player. When you get to a certain age, your body is starting to change. You can still jump mm-hmm. high, but not as high as you used to. You can still run fast, but not as fast as you used to. Those aches and the longevity of a season will catch up with you. So now is the time for athletic players in their late 20s, early 30s, is to dominate the elbows, similar to Kobe and Jordan, with the catch, without the dribble, conserve energy, yeah. get to the box, mm-hmm. find a way to be a playmaker and score in the paint and get to the free throw line. And then it's like, it's almost like chess. And then as the fourth quarter come, the last three minutes, the last six minutes of the fourth quarter, now you have the ball in your hands and you're coming off pick and rolls, using all your energy to get to the rim, or using all your energy to get fouled and to make plays for others. Kobe learned that over the years through the triangle, which is natural. And MJ had it because of the triangle as well. Right. What, why do you think Westbrook gets so much uh, gets so much? I mean, if you really look at the history of sports and the history of the black athlete, to me, Russell is one of the first in a long time to be the most outspoken, flamboyant athlete in the NBA. He started the dress. He started the fashion. He has a line at Barney's. He started like the, this is me, love me or hate me. Why not? In your face, right. loud. You know, when he had come to the game with a blazer and no shirt on, with a gold chain, like, yeah. you know, he had come dressed up as a custodial worker, like whatever he it's feels Halloween. like. Every game night's Halloween. You know, it's, it's yeah. just the UCLA way to, the UCLA way for, for athletes is to be very, you know, very, 
transformative and creative and beyond just whoever you Confident. are be that yeah. you know he comes from a bloodline of like Kareem Abdul Jabbar because we have to explain that as a lot of kids yes, right yeah, yeah. from uh yeah from Arthur Ashe from Jackie Robinson and you have these players who are just outspoken and just big big personalities so when he goes into these arenas he's easy to pick at but Russ is really one of the nicest people in the world he's really he has to be that edgy because he's really that nice in real life. Mm-hmm. So it's this extreme, and he understands he can't let his softness creep into the court. Yeah, I think I think everything you said is spot on. It's it's hard to figure out sometimes because all the things that Russ goes through as a player on the court, if it's it easily happens to other players and other superstars as well. But it's like anytime Russ has anything off in his game, it's overly scrutinized, and it's because he's unapologetic. And unapologetic people are easier to come at because it's like, oh, I told you so. Right. This is what's I, we said that was going to happen because you play like this when other players play like this, and it's it's the same way. So you talked a lot about uh, roles. When did you first learn about roles in the NBA? Um, first time I learned about roles in the NBA was when my second year in the NBA at our gym was Jerry West, and ten games in we hired Hubie Brown, and. I was young and dumb, and I was like, damn, we hired a TNT guy, right? (laughs) Right. He walks into the – and at the time, Bob (laughs) Myers, who's the GM of Golden State, was my agent. What? Yeah, it's crazy. So I'm texting Bob like, yo, why the hell we hired a TNT guy? And Bob was like, he's not the TNT guy. Like, he used to coach. I'm like, when? He was like, in the 70s. I was like, dude, I was born in 79, (laughs) right? So Jerry West introduces him, and he walks into the locker room. And we were, it was a losing culture in Memphis. Mm -hmm. It was Jerry West's first year. I came from Seattle my first year with Gary Payton, my second year in the NBA. And Jerry introduces him, and uh, Hubie Brown walks in. And on that team at that time was myself, Shane Battier, Powell Gasol, Strollmouth Swift. Um, I believe we had a bunch of younger young players. And we had a nice young core. We just was just young. Jason Williams, Lorenzen Wright, the white, original white chocolate, right? Jay Will. Shouts out. And we had a and Brevin. Now we had a young core. We just didn't know who we were. And Hubie Brown comes in and he goes, for, <laughs> he goes, first off, let me just say this. All of you are fucking losers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 22 years old, right? I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm from the streets. I've never had anyone that does not look like right. a shade like yeah. me call me a like loser, right? right. And, and like, now say so. So he goes, all of you are fucking losers. I'm here to show you and tell you how to be fucking winners. He was like, if you was a fucking winner, the last guy would still be here. But instead, he's packing his bags mm. and moving his family. He was like, and you are so fucking selfish to realize that you just got a family and a dad and a father and a son fired. I'm like, yo, this dude is me. <laughs> dude from TNT, yeah. wilding right and here. And he was like, we're going to have two a days for the next week. We like ten games into the season. I'm like, two a days. Mm-hmm. Like, come on, man. Like, he was like, and no. I'm going to teach you how to be a winner. He's like, ten of you are going to love me because only thirteen players on the mm-hmm. team. Three of you are going to hate me. All of you are going to learn how to be man of character. All of you are going to learn how to play in the NBA for 10 plus years. And all of you are going to fucking become mature men. Wow. And he just like said, practice, let's go practice. So he walked out the locker room, everyone lingering in the locker room like, yo, this dude is evil. And he was the best coach I ever had in my life. And that says a lot because I played for Jerry Sloan. I've been around amazing coaches, George Carl, Nate McMillan. The list goes on. Like Dick Harder, um, so many, Dwayne Casey, the, the list goes on. But this guy wow. really changed my life. There's been a lot of talk about old school coaches. I don't know. Could, could that work today? Could someone walk in the locker room today? Uh, it depends NBA on. NBA locker room, too. Yeah, it, no, no. Of course, yeah, NBA, yeah, NBA yeah. locker room. You, you have to walk in with some merit. You know, like, I think this is what I think about coaching young players. There's so, and this is from experience, there's so much um, extra, you know, untrue baggage that comes comes along with young players because they see the – they see like the floss on Instagram. They mm-hmm. see like the, the the awards and the merits and the lifestyle. They don't understand what it really takes to get all of that. Right. They don't really understand the hard work. They don't understand the sacrifice. They don't understand just because you can dribble, shoot, dunk, and pass doesn't mean that's what helps us win games. And that's what Kyrie is kind of saying right now. Right. Like you have to sacrifice something. Kyrie's like, yo, I can go get 40 every night. 
but I have to sacrifice something too, and you do too. And you know, I'm gonna take the last. I'm gonna take the majority of the shots. Like these players need to be taught how to be a professional before they can ever be a winning player in the NBA, and that's difficult. What did you think about what Tom Izzo did? I don't have a problem with the yelling in so much as I feel like the optics of lunging at a player and pointing at a player were like too much. I think for me personally as as a younger coach and I've been coached by only older Hall of Fame coaches. Right. I've always struggled with young coaches because they don't tell you the truth. Mm. And I feel like as a coach, the biggest sin you can make is to lie to one of your players. Mm. So when I coach, I have to tell you the truth. I have to say it in front of everyone. I don't want any rumors. But before I even get to that point where I'm criticizing you, it's something called off-season, right? So when you have an off-season, that's when you better get to know your players personally right. off the court so they can trust you to be criticized on the court. Mm-hmm. And one thing I promise my players, I will never cuss you out while you on the court, if anything, I would do it in a closed huddle or in the locker room. On the court, I'm going to call you over, and I'm going to say, hey, look, this is what we need to do. If we get in a huddle and I have to fire you up and motivate you, I'm not going to embarrass you for the whole front row to here. Mm-hmm. To me, that's embarrassing as a player. And I also never wanted my coaches to be over dramatic. Because if they feel like if I feel like they're over dramatic or they're like going crazy, how am I supposed to keep my control right. as a point guard? Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to take on that personality. Right. So I think there's rhythms to it. Izzo is a Hall of Fame coach without a doubt. But when you coach any sport long enough, and he's great enough to coach this long, you have to evolve. If you don't evolve and understand the rhythms and the social environment mm-hmm. of these younger kids, you're going to eventually lose that connection. And that's why you got to go back to Popovich. He's done everything he can in his power to right. understand this new generation. Right. From reading books about what it's like growing up African-American in the United States, from you know reaching out to different resources and bringing people in to talk to his team and asking questions on how to coach this new generational player. So he's constantly reinventing himself in order to connect. Sticking with the tournaments, do you, I mean, I picked Duke, Tennessee, UNC, and Gonzaga in the Final Four. I don't know who your Final Four was. I don't know either. Forgive me, I don't remember. Okay, so who who do you think is gonna is gonna end up winning the tournament? I don't know. I think that's the beauty of the tournament. I think what we saw with um, you know last weekend or Duke barely winning right. with right. you know UCF. at the buzzer mm-hmm. like you know getting offensive rebound at the free throw line putting it back in anything can happen. And to me, that's a compliment to the growth and development of grassroots mm-hmm. basketball. Mm-hmm. It's so big and so much skill is going into it and it's constantly growing that all the best players in the country are no longer going to dominate power schools. You have these schools with players who are skilled enough to play in a 40-minute game, Mm -hmm. but they're not skilled enough to play in a 48-minute game. And that's the NBA because talent takes over with that extra eight minutes. So you have this impact, and I think the NCAA just kind of lucked out into it that grassroots basketball is growing. You can have a taco fall. You can have a job moran. And you can have schools that are, you know, pushing almost upsetting, if not upsetting the top schools. What do you think of taco fall? Taco fall, for those of you who don't know, give him Google. He's seven... Six. Six. Seven, six. six. Yeah. Yeah. Um, seven, seven. Yeah. He's very he's very large. But he's also he's quick though. How, do you think he translates to the to the NBA? I think he translates to the NBA because of his speed. He's a vertical player, north and south. He gets to the rim quick. Defensively, he's obvious a, a big time defender and he protects the paint. In the NBA, he can't sit in the paint. Right. They got the two nine. Right. Defensive rule. So it'd be interesting to see if he has a jump shot, because I don't really know. Right, I don't know if he can yeah. shoot an elbow jump shot, but I know one thing: when he rolls to the rim, that weak side is going to have to tag, which means that corner three is going to be open. Mm-hmm. So he's going to make the defense just shift. He'll be a disruptor. Which is yeah, it's gonna, he's going to make it shift, which is difficult to do because he can if he throw a lob, he's at the rim without jumping. Right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. it's just going <laughs> to be a, <laughs> yeah. If he just picks and rolls to the rim, right. you have to honor that, and that's going to force that defense to the shift. It's going to be weak side three, so he could have an impact. What's the tournament like? What's the environment like there? Uh, the tournament, um, it's it's amazing. And, you know, for me, just going into the tournament with the UCLA legacy, mm-hmm. it's nothing like it. You really feel like with UCLA, you're running out onto the court and you have Kareem and Bill Walton, Lou Alcindor, Gail Goodrich, you know, Sidney Wicks on your team. And that's what people expect for that tradition. And the environment is very unique and every play matters. The crowd is overly excited. 
And if you lose, you go home. And if you win, you might get some gifts from the NCAA. <laughs> so you have that motivational factor, right? Man. You might get, you know, back then it was like a video game. You might get whatever it is now. You yeah. progress. And it's a lot of pride. And it's very emotional. And you see majority of the families attend tournament games. Mm -hmm. Because that's when most families can make it. And it's the right. most important. Um, all right. Well, we can't get you out of here without talking about um, this L.A. team. The Lakers. Oh yeah, um, what, to me, squad. well, yeah, it's, it's, oh, you don't know, Brandon has adopted the Lakers now. That's a team. That's, yeah, a, that's, that's a team. Me, now. Yeah. How do you feel about the Lakers? Um, How long have you been a Lakers fan for? Oh, Two, three man. years. I mean, like nine months. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the months, but months would sound a lot more than years. Oh, okay. Years about three. About three. About three, three are going on four years. This is this is pedigree for millennials. We out here. <laughs> How do you feel about the Lakers? Uh, you know, what I mean. Uh, I've said that uh, the Laker, the NBA and the NFL free agency is more suspenseful than the film Us. Y'all seen Us yet? Yes. We watched Us last night, yeah. Is, yeah. The, is the free agency a little bit more suspenseful than... It, it is. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's, 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 yeah. what, that's what I'm saying. So I'm saying we're watching it, and LeBron's setting up for a great comeback. I'll say that. He's set, he's setting up right now for a, a tremendous comeback. So you, Pay so, oh, okay. So what what you're, what he what he's trying to say is that um, it's down time right now. This, so so this was all planned, this was orchestrated. Yeah, he's like, orchestrated. This I mean, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Some people are like, supposed to sit out for six months. They sit out for five six weeks. You know what I mean? Like you know things happen. But LeBron's out here for the fans. He's averaging twenty seven eight and eight. Like he's still out here. The Lakers are trash. LeBron's all right. LeBron's all right. LeBron's all right. Lakers trash. LeBron's okay. What, how do you feel they can improve? Like it's it's gonna take somebody in the front office. Some somebody got to tell Rob or Rob Plinka or Magic Johnson what to do because I don't know if they necessarily know what to do. I I mean I say clean house. LeBron, everybody, everybody Genie can stay. Everyone goes. Not every, you know what I'm saying. But Magic's gone. I mean. Yes, Magic's not going anywhere. We're gonna, like, we gonna keep hiring these names. We're gonna get Hubie Brown in here. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna get this like, get big names. Hubie They're gonna get great. big names hey. just lined up on Hubie. the staff. Hey, I vote, I vote when, Hubie. When, when Hubie took over our team, we won like 25 games, and next year we won like 52. Major, major push for major key. Here's here, here's my <laughs> thing. Here's my thing about the Lakers, right? Um, great, the greatest players to ever play a game. They do this. They find a way to reinvent their, their style of play. Okay. LeBron has to find a way to conserve energy. He has to, like I said, master the elbows, master the mid post, get to the free throw line. He should get to the free throw line 10 to 12 times per game. Got to make them, though. It doesn't matter. He needs to get there. Yeah. Right? You have to get there before you can make them or yeah. miss them. So you have to get there. And then out of that, you can have a new style of play. And at the end of the game, you can go back to to LeBron, high pick and roll, jumping over players and getting to the rim. Um, here's here's the danger. Like if, if I'm sitting in that office and in, in the war room and we throwing players up on the board and what what are we going to do? If we trade our young players now, two years from now we're going to be in the same situation as D'Angelo Russell, where he's an All Star. Mm. Right, and that's that's going to be two point guards you lost that are all stars, for a player who could potentially win a championship for us, maybe one, in his late thirties. Mm. Right, mm -hmm. if you bring in Anthony Davis, which is it's not going to happen because we all know Celtics have more assets than the Lakers, right. but if say you got lucky and you brought in Anthony Davis, you still don't have shooting. Right. So if, if 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 I'm coaching against the Lakers and LeBron and Anthony Davis is in a pick and roll. I have my entire weak side in the paint with a tag. I Meaning as Anthony Davis roll, we tagging him, we slowing him up, tag. Skip it to the weak side. I'm gonna close out to a non shooter short. Right. And if we get beat by non shooters beyond the three, at least it was Anthony Davis and LeBron. The worst right? the worst insult is that's what we want. When somebody when you take a shot and somebody scream, that's what we want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, 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 or fighting words. Or you hey. just let him sit out there oh, like nobody man. even makes just an attempt to go shot. get him. Or they oh, scream, yeah. or they scream, he's with us. <laughs> he's with us. Like, you know, so the Lakers need so the Lakers need shooting. Mm -hmm. The Lakers, they're gonna have to part with some of the young pieces, but which ones do you part with? And then how can you get LeBron in a system? 
that we all know what it is. Like we know the roles, we know the identity, we know the style of play, and we know who needs to improve their game. Because right now, I don't know from game to game who's going to be his his second option or third option. LeBron doesn't know his role right now. I think that's a big part of the problem with the Lakers is you're talking about a a need-based draft. People, we don't know what player LeBron wants to be. If he wants to be the best five he wants to be a, 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 a good, decent four. Like we don't even know where LeBron's going to be on the court. He's I, a point guard. I think I think that's easily fixed, right? Whoever was Luke Walton, whoever is the okay. coach, they spend like a week with LeBron, not even on the court. Go to his place of comfort if it's his house yeah, or his office yeah. or whatever it is. It's the off season, yeah. so you say, "Hey, look, what is, what is your role?" Because this is superstar is different. When you talk to a superstar, you can't really tell him mm-hmm. this is what you're going to do. You're going to ask him, how can we be a, have a partnership in creating a great system so you're always comfortable, right? You're always comfortable. You're always at your highest point. And he's going to be honest with you. He's going to say, look, at this point in my career, I want my minutes to be like 34 minutes a game, right? I do want the ball in my hands, but I'm, I'm open – to not having the ball in my hands the entire game. But I need to close quarters, and I need to close games, Mm. right? And then you can say, perfect. Now let me go back and let me create a system around my greatest player. Coach Wooden had me in Encino at his condo. I had to go visit him when I was at UCLA. Coach Wooden, he put me down when his when his den and his, his books everywhere and he's reciting poetry and he's talking about how he would write his wife love letters who had passed away for 20 plus years every Sunday. He put it in an envelope and put it under his bed and he just pulled him out and showed me, right? Damn. And, then, and then he goes, look, it's twice in my career I did not run the UCLA high post, which is a 1-4 offense the bigs are at the elbows, mm-hmm. the guards are at the wings. It's only twice in my career that I didn't run the offense I created, which is UCLA high post. I'm 18 years old. I'm from Kansas City. I don't even know where the hell I'm at. Encino just sounds so far. <laughs> right? And he's right. asking me, like, do you know when? I'm like, right. man, I don't even know how to get home from here. Right. Like, there's right. no GPS. MapQuest. I just go to MapQuest and print it out. <laughs> yeah. and, right? and I'm like, how am I going to get here and look at the paper at the same time? Right? So I'm like... Coach, I don't know when. Yeah. And he's like, kind of disappointed I didn't know. I'm like, damn, I disappointed him already. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, when I had Lou Alcindor and Bill Walton, he was like, greatest coaches are the greatest teachers. You have to adjust your style of play mm. and identity of your team around your greatest superstars. So whoever coaches LeBron needs to sit down with him, get him into a partnership so now he's fully committed, and it's going to. Who else? Who's not going to follow that in the locker room? When LeBron right. said, "This is what it is," yeah. your head coach says, "This is what it is." Then this is what it is. Like you're going to get better in a role with identity, but you have to have him committed first. You have so many stories. Damn, yeah, I was. I was That's crazy, right? I was beautiful. I just. I was there. I you was in the basement. To, to, I saw to, the thing. Yeah, the, the the poetry. It was a beautiful. Oh, he, he, he was super dope. Oh my like, gosh, wouldn't one of the best. The goat. Yeah, he is. Isn't that nice that he wrote his his uh, his wife or his his yeah his wife I need letters. To do something like that. I need, to get, I need to do something like that. Yeah, I, I didn't want to say no, but I, I really when you did your uh, vows, yeah, I appreciate you? the freestyle at the end. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I, yeah, noticed he, I noticed he it. To, I, uh, I noticed it. He wants to freestyle the whole thing. I, I noticed told, it. I had, I had to prep Michelle too because she you wanted to read it after. She was like, let me see the vow. Let me see them. Let me see. I was like, now nah, I'm gonna tell you at the end. Um, you know what I mean? I, I kind of you know, went off the dock. Uh, uh, I, was, I, 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 I told noticed. myself when I was up at the thing, I said I want to write the last sentence on the beach. You know what I'm saying? When I see your, you know what I'm saying? When you come down, <laughs> I want to like write the last <laughs> sentence. But then I, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's just me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was tough. He wants to freestyle the whole thing. You want to freestyle the whole? Yeah, why not? Yeah. My brother freestyled his speech. Yeah. His these. Yeah, freestyle you. Uh, Man, freestyle it. It's easy. Uh, I mean, it's easy to think a no, beautiful don't, don't thing that. and don't how you feel. Get, get a little, get a little uh, let me use the right paper. You got the out, outline. outline. You got the, the big, bold things like this and this and this and this. Just do that. He nah. knows how to do an outline. Yeah, like, yeah just do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm freestyling. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> 
with the time, it's, it's important with the timing. When I, because I only thought she, I heard that she wrote a two minute thing. I was like, damn, hers was tough. Hers was I, really I, I good. Yeah. yeah, she went, she went ham. She went yeah, ham you had pressure. no choice but the freestyle <laughs> because <laughs> that, because when, no, she, she went first, and when he read his, he <laughs> oh, knew like, yo, this is God. not even close. So let me just Why freestyle. Why did I say that? I didn't say that. It's, you but he felt said it. it. You felt and it. I you felt him. it. But, but hers was so good. You had to. Yeah, you gotta get let her. You had to. Yeah, I was like, oh, she. Oh, okay, she winning this. Okay, she. She got this. It's good though. She's just upped your game. No, yeah, that's yeah, a great point. Yeah, that's what, that's what she's yeah, supposed yeah. to do. Squad, squad, yeah. ring, ring. Yes, ring, ring. <laughs> <laughs> just like you do, babe. When you come in and tell us your stories. Yeah, I like a lot of stories. Yes. Yeah, so next yeah. time you come in, we'll, we'll tell some more stories. Like I was yeah. telling them about some of your injuries uh, before yeah, you came yeah, in. You say you got two glass plates in your. What? No. Nah. <laughs> Tori's retina. <laughs> yeah, I tore my retina in a tournament game versus Maryland, but it was like it was when I had 17 points, 15 assists. Woo! It's the record Moran just tied, yeah. right? Yeah, but no, I, 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 I tore I, my I, retina early, and all I knew was like blood was just shooting down. You tore your retina during that game? During the game. Is like, that when you got your assist up? I mean, it was a perfect game. I was like Ooh. seven for seven, 15 oh. assists, no turnovers. I was so I was so fucking mad, right? So I went back to the huddle, and Lav was like, "You need stitches." I was like. That butterfly, it. He was mm. like, put it on, put it on, G. put it back on. Went out, set records. Next morning, my eye was swollen. Yeah, went into surgery. Band aids don't do well for that. Nah, they didn't do well uh, in a straight mm-hmm. surgery. Mm-hmm. The eye part of the eye. Yeah, that's why I can't. I can never complain. Every time I like, I get like a pain in my side or yeah. something. He's like. She has a lot of Lady Gaga extremes, you know. I like, think that's a compliment. I haven't seen it. You know, yeah, but, no, but did you I see think... the? Did you see the Lady Gaga uh, Netflix documentary? You saw it, Ari? Yeah. I mean, he says I act like that. She does, and I'm a big Lady Gaga like fan. No, like, yeah, but, yeah, I'm like that. But <laughs> any small thing with joy is like the end of the world. Like, I'm like, I just, you know, I used to be like, oh, my I God, are you that. okay? And I'm like, dude, do we need to go to the hospital? She's no, like, no, I'm like, well, we good then. Let's go. Oh, Suck it up. Yeah, Let's I go. Never, I never knew that it's about just, you. It's just air you're breathing. You didn't like, know that I was traumatic? I didn't know. Yeah, no, it's just like air. She breathe air like, my side hurts. How do you keep that away from the workplace? How do you yeah, just right. only do that at home? That's interesting. I doubt oh, thank that. Thank you for saying that, yeah, Brandon. Of course. Yeah, I doubt I that. Know. Ashley cool. disagrees. <laughs> I doubt that. Yo, it's like, yo, what are we doing? Are we on the same quiet? Are we gonna <laughs> eat these trolls at Disneyland or are we gonna go to the hospital? Because I can't do both right now. Like I'm not pushing you in a wheelchair. But that's not fair. I got <laughs> I got sick of, at Disneyland. Off the turkey leg. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly, sick what do you mean? Leg. We, we, allegedly. Yeah. The yeah. turkey I leg. I got check. an intestine infection that's not allegedly that's, we don't know that's, oh, it's in the it's turkey leg. and it's an infection I mean, it's like what is you know what I, I mean I, like, I, I said, there's Joy, no x-ray of it I said Joy you're like 5'2 you can't eat a turkey leg like 1'2 <laughs> like it's half your body. You're gonna get sick. Like yeah. it's half your size. Some, like, something's gonna go wrong. We gonna find some words. Yeah. to Talk about how you. What's she going had on her you. and a bunch of little kids holding it so she could eat it because it was too big. It was like <laughs> little kids holding the turkey like, leg. That's what. Like, that's what it came from. It was that big. Little kids' like, hands. You can't move yeah. your hands. And she was like, oh, I want a chimichanga. I'm like, dude, you can't eat that and a chimichanga. <laughs> <laughs> and then go get like churros. Like you're gonna get yeah. sick. Now, you got you gotta save, save room for churros. You're gonna get sick. You gotta save room. can't have turkey. He laid chimichangas and a churro in 30 minutes. Yeah, plan a sick day the next day. Come on, man. You can't I do mean, that. I'm just trying to live on the edge. I was hungry. No, oh, yeah. Live your best <laughs> life, for sure. It, it was, until I, until it was not. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, never mind. I'm going to end it here. This is fine. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, we never seen you sick in a closet. <laughs> 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 that's for, that was because of Joy though. That's Joy. Well, that's yeah, Joy's that margarita was, making skills. Yeah, margaritas. Yeah, margaritas. <laughs> yeah. I got skills. What can just, I say? Just a lot of tequila and it's so it's priced so well you can't taste it. Just sleep. Good <laughs> balance. Just not. You were a quick quick nap in the closet. A little nap in the closet. Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, just. <laughs> It's coming up again soon. Yeah. Oh, y'all got a shout out in in uh, in Michelle's uh, bridesmaids. Oh uh, yeah. No. Oh yeah, we did. Oh, what, what, what was that for? Sexy uh, Halloween party. <laughs> oh, that's right. All right. That's right. We did. We got. I forgot about that. We got a yeah. shout out in the um in the bridesmaids. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Uh, y'all all over the place. Man. Um, speech. Yeah, y'all, that's right. Y'all, y'all, y'all are hit it the way. Well, we're happy big in Florida. Yeah, we're yeah, happy. Yeah, 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 happy big, to yeah. influence your uh, your marriage in such a positive way. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we have, oh yeah. Where's the gift at? Oh Damn. man. <laughs> oh, 
This that's not fair. I told you to remind me. That's why, that's why I'm doing it. I'm doing it now. It's, it's, I'm going it's, 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 it's in your together. email, bro. Ask yeah. you for your oh, email. Come on, come on. Did I, I, I not ask you for your email? Did I not text you? Like a week later? Oh, my God. It's, 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 I, I agree with him. It's your fault. You're supposed to remind me. You're supposed to remind me. A week later. I'm like, yo, send me your email. I'm going to seem thirsty for the gift. You know what I'm saying? I'm not. I'm just asking him because you told me. You're not, but you just said it right here. You told me to remind you. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing the due diligence. First off, I asked him what did he want for his wedding gift. He asked for some ZO2s. I'm like, do you still want those? Are those still valid? Are we still What's doing that? Big Baller brand? Listen, I was going to I was going to rock the RIP Big Baller brand hoodie today. But do uh, you want the ZO2 still? Want, you know what I'm saying? I think those are easy to get right I, now. <laughs> do you still want those? If the, if you can prove the money goes to Lonzo and not Allen, I'm good. I'm like I'm like <laughs> I'm like yo. What about your What about your wife? Yeah, like, for real. That's very selfish. Matching ZO2. Oh, you didn't say <laughs> matching. Matching. You didn't say matching. I was I was I left you said ZO2 size thirteen. You just gave me the size. I was gonna be like Michelle. Yeah, I don't know what he just uh, gave me. Yeah, Earl that's shady. I'm with you, babe. That's, <laughs> that's super no. shady. All right, guys, gang, gang. this has been fun. Thanks, Earl. Yeah. <laughs>